it's a beautiful um, embodiment of the, the type of collaboration that you can still find on campuses across the country. Today, uh, we really feel like, you know, the, the, the adage, like the rising, uh, was the rising tide raises all ships is, is very true. And we, um, there's all kinds of very interesting collaborations that you'll see across the country that really do lift up all types of um, different students and celebrate their, their needs and identities. Welcome to Student Affairs Now, the online learning community for student affairs educators. I am your co-host, Heather Shea. Today, my colleague, Cody Nielsen, and I are hosting this episode celebrating 100 years of Halal International on college and university campuses. In today's episode, we'll celebrate this milestone as well as reflect upon the impact of religion, spirituality, and Jewish identity in higher education. In an age when higher education believes itself to be secular, Hillel International and its on-campus presence continually proves that religious and spiritual identities matter in several significant ways. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We hope you'll find these conversations make a contribution to the field and are restorative to the profession. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find us at studentaffairsnow.com, on YouTube, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Today's episode is sponsored by Simplicity, a true partner. Simplicity supports all aspects of student life with technology platforms that empower institutions to make data-driven decisions. This episode is also brought to you by Stylus. Visit styluspub.com and use promo code SANOW for 30% off and free shipping. Stay tuned to the end of the podcast for more information about each of these sponsors. As I mentioned, I'm your co-host for today's episode, Heather Shea. My pronouns are she, her, and her, and I am broadcasting from the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples, otherwise known as East Lansing, Michigan, home to the campus of Michigan State University where I work. Our university resides on land seated in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. And now I'm going to have Cody introduce himself. Welcome, Cody. Thank you, Heather. Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, as you've already mentioned, my name is Cody Nielsen. I use he, him, and his pronouns. And I'm broadcasting today from Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and Dickinson College, um, which is on the lands of the Susquehannock community and is home of the former Carlisle Indian Industrial School, which is unfortunately the first reprogramming school for Native identities in the United States. I'm grateful to serve um, as co-host on this episode and equally thrilled to have President and CEO of Halal International, Adam Lehman, as well as Debbie Yunker Kale, the Executive Director of the Halal Jewish Student Center at Arizona State, joining us. So, welcome. Yeah, thank you both so much for being here today. I'm I'm thrilled um, for the conversation we're about to have. Uh, I'd love to have each of you give our audience a bit of a longer introduction um, than just your professional titles uh, and a little bit about maybe your journey to your work with Hillel. Um, and so Adam, we're gonna have you uh, start us off today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Cody. Be really grateful to be able to be a part of this conversation. Uh, as Cody mentioned, Adam Lehman with Hill International, grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, proud but always disappointed Cleveland sports fan, just that's the way it is. Uh, <laughs> And in terms of finding my way to my current work at Hill International, I think there are really two threads that uh, brought me to this place. On the one side, most of my professional career was, was actually in entrepreneurship, working uh, as a co-founder and entrepreneur on a variety of technology, media, and similar uh, new ventures. Um, in, in fact, at a higher education level. I did spend a period of time, four years, I think, as an entrepreneur in residence at the University of Maryland uh, Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center. Um, at the same time in my personal life, I was very involved and invested in uh, Jewish communal life and really in religious uh, life and community more broadly. And uh, I had the opportunity, you know, in my way of thinking about it, it was, uh, you know, kind of, uh, heaven sent, I suppose, in terms of the opportunity to come in and work with uh, the Hillel movement, which for me 
was such a blessing because Hill, as we'll talk about, has a, a re really unique posture in terms of its pluralistic approach to Jewish life and its strong integration with the broader campus community. So when that opportunity afforded itself uh, eight years ago, uh, to me, it was, it, as I said, a real blessing, and I'm excited to be here as part of this conversation. Well, welcome. We're really grateful for you um, giving us a little bit of your time today. I know you have a very, very busy schedule, so this is this is fantastic. Um, Debbie, tell us a little bit about you. Sure, and thanks so much for having me. Um, again, Debbie Yunker kill I use she, her pronouns, and um, I have been the executive director for Hillel at Arizona State for about nine and a half years now. Um, I've been in Hillel my whole career, actually. So um, grew up in a Boston suburb, Framingham, Massachusetts, for anyone listening who knows it. Um, and when I was uh, graduating from Emory University, I was looking for something meaningful to do with my psychology degree and um, happened upon, had a strong Jewish identity, but um, wasn't so involved communally and happened upon a fellowship opportunity through Hello International, um, the precursor to what's now the Springboard Fellowship. And great opportunity to, to move out to St. Louis, worked at WashU for a couple of years, um, engaging uninvolved Jewish students in uh, different types of opportunities and through there got exposed to the field of higher education. Um, admittedly did not know that was a career path um, available to me. Um, ended up getting a master's in higher ed and I'm at NYU and always wanted to come back to the Hillel world. And so I did that after grad school, um, working at the University of Pennsylvania for seven years until I came out here. And so uh, Hillel kind of found me based on my passions. It just seemed to be a really great fit. And uh, I've never really wanted to walk away from the college age um, population at that point. And so I'm, I'm really grateful to be here today also. Um, in my roles through um, Hill International, I also have the opportunity to chair our director's cabinet, uh, which affords me the opportunity to have more of a national viewpoint. So in addition to um, the work that we're doing here, um, I work with colleagues from across the country on larger um, initiatives and issues that face um, our North American student population. Great. Excellent. Well, Debbie, thank you as well for being here. Um, I'm really looking forward to that sort of national as well as local conversation throughout. Um, okay, so we're just going to sort of start at the top. Um, you know, the name Hillel is very synonymous on college campuses as being around Jewish life, but there are a lot of folks that have sort of always maybe just asked, like, what is that that Hillel is about? And so, you know, Anna, I want to sort of start with the basics. Like, can you give us in a sort of one sentence synopsis what's the purpose or the mission of Hillel is? And I'm sure from there we will expand outward. Yeah, our stated mission is to enrich the lives of Jewish students so they can in turn enrich the Jewish people and the world. And I'd love to, you know, expand on that in terms of what it means today, because as you guys alluded to, we're 100 years old. And so even the language is imbued in part with uh, what I would think of as legacy terms, but I, there's a lot of vibrancy to how we take that notion of mission and translate it into our vision for today and the future. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can we just talk about that sort of vision and maybe sort of like the current scope and sort of where Hillel is headed, if you can sort of share about that for a couple minutes with us? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to do it in that order. I'll talk a little bit about big picture vision, because as we celebrate our centennial, we're on the one hand, of course, um, recalling and lifting up memories of the past hundred years and the impact Hillel has had, but we're also looking forward to the vision for the next hundred years. And as I think about that, I'm really looking at number one, uh, inclusivity. We aim to be the most inclusive Jewish student organization we can be, and really ideally the most inclusive overall organization possible within the university landscape. Number two, going from inclusivity to imagination. You know, our vision is to inspire all the incredible young people we're privileged to serve to really open their minds through exposure to Jewish life, Jewish wisdom, Jewish practice, Jewish community, and co-create what the Jewish future will be on campus and beyond. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, our vision revolves around impact. We we are in the business, as we see it, of changing hearts, minds, and lives. We want to 
be an awesome resource platform and partner to students in terms of their Jewish journeys and their overall personal journeys. So then that impact can extend, extend across campus. We very much see ourselves as wanting to be and striving to be a great partner to the broader campus community. And then for that impact to extend, you know, to the wider community and world. That's, you know, at least ambitiously what we're hoping for uh, in terms of our role. I, relative to where we are in that process, which Cody gets to this question of, okay, like, where are you and, and you know, how are you actually doing this work? We're present on uh, approximately 850 campuses that is primarily in North America, although we are operating in 16 countries around the world. Some of the most inspiring work happening today at Hillel is in Ukraine, where we have uh, five Hillels, 46 Hill professionals, and uh, now several thousand students, Jewish and beyond, who are engaged in just such incredible work, volunteering uh, and serving their communities. Um, and that work, is powered by 1,200 professionals who really are, in their hearts and their core, student affairs professionals. They are the um, life and soul of who we are as a movement. And Debbie's a, a fantastic example of the kind of great leader and great student affairs professional in a Jewish life context who uh, powers and advances our work. Great. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Well, Congratulations on celebrating 100 years. That that is a phenomenal, um, you know, kind of milestone to hit. But also, I love the thinking about where you're headed in the future. Uh, let's take a moment though and look back, um, Debbie. I'm I'm really curious. What is the origin story of Halal? And then to take it to the kind of more local level, if you could talk a little bit about how Halal got started at your campus at Arizona State. Sure. Um, yeah, I'd love to share both with you. They're both interesting stories, and um, we're always working to uncover more about our history here um, locally. Is the the um, the date that we're established is a little bit of a moving target, but we're we're narrowing in <laughs> on it. Um, so let's let's go um, national first. So um, so Hillel International. So the Hillel movement began in in 1923 in a rented room above a barber shop in uh, the college town of Champaign, Illinois. Um, Rabbi Benjamin Frankel of Blessed said memory inaugurated the first program for a handful of Jewish students who were at the University of Illinois. Um, and he, like we do today, wanted to create a thriving, vibrant Jewish community where all Jewish students could be together and be their whole selves, um, which, you know, I'm sure we'll get into a little bit. Sometimes Jewish people and other minorities don't, don't always feel like they have the spaces to do that. Um, what's interesting is that the kind of the pillars that, um, he laid out for Hillel are still true today. Um, this comes from the University of Michigan's archives, um, talented professional staff, education and learning, uh, quote, beyond a Sunday school level. Um, so, you know, I, I like to say, you know, our, our Jewish identity is sometimes, you know, students come to college with maybe a 13 year old Jewish identity or a five year old Jewish identity, um, depending on, and certainly some um, with a fully grown 18 year old Jewish identity, depending on, um, what their background is. Um, other pillars welcoming every student, regardless of background or denomination, um, embracing Jewish values that make the world a better place and focusing, of course, on student leadership. Um, ASU goes back pretty far also and has very similar values. So just real quick, our history is, is kind of interesting. Um, at Congregation Beth Israel was um, one of the early synagogues here in town. Um, and in 1938, a rabbi named um, Rabbi Abraham Lincoln Crone um, came to town to, um, to lead that synagogue. And soon after that, sought out to support Jewish students as well. And so they started meeting in this, in this same space, which is what is now downtown Phoenix in um, a building that's now the Arizona Jewish Historical Society, actually. And um, at some point they started um, meeting in a shared space with the um, Methodists on campus. And for many, many years, Hillel and the Methodist group were intertwined in space and certainly in um, certain programming as well. Um, eventually in the early 80s, um, some supporters of Hillel and the Hillel students felt like they needed their own space for a variety of reasons and built the building that we currently occupy now. Um, and so that building is aging and looking for some, um, some love and attention, but has been there and served 
thousands and thousands of students throughout the years and just honestly embracing these same values that um, Rabbi Benjamin Frankel outlined so many years ago. You know, Debbie, I, I feel like I would be remiss without sort of adding in on this, that um, this story of, of the experience at, at, at ASU around the Methodists is really parallel to, to an origin story that I told to another colleague of yours a few years ago mm -hmm. about what I uncovered in some of my work around religious pluralism at the University of Illinois. Um, so... The University of Illinois is sort of a seedbed for religion and spirituality in like a very significant set of ways. Um, and as somebody who comes out of Christian privilege and also comes out of life formerly as a United Methodist, um, the first uh, Methodist campus ministry known as the Wesley Foundation was founded in October of 1913 at the University of Illinois too. But what was surprising is that when I learned about Halal's founding, founding in 1923, I also learned that part of it had to do with the Jewish community and the Jewish students at the University of Illinois, starting by going to the Methodist campus ministry and asking the then Reverend uh, James Baker if he could help support them. And there is some archival knowledge that like we seem to have that Baker was influential in helping to start that first Hillel and then both of those communities were influential in helping to start the first Muslim Student Association at the University of Illinois in 1947. So I really feel like the story of Hillel is not only a story of the Jewish community, but such a deep intrinsic story of religious pluralism and spirituality at large on our campuses. It's a beautiful um, embodiment of the, the type of collaboration that you can still find on campuses across the country today. Um, we really feel like, you know, the 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 adage like the rising uh was the rising tide raises all ships is, is very true and we um there's all kinds of very interesting collaborations that you'll see across the country that really do lift up all types of um different students and celebrate their their needs and identities yeah yeah i think i think adam i want to bring your voice into this a little bit more because i want you to sort of see you know from your from your level as the as the ceo of Hill international can you share about like sort of what are the big highlights of, of Hillel International's impact on higher ed over that last hundred years? Yeah, and what, what a big question, right? A hundred years, hundreds of <laughs> institutions, you know, tens of thousands of professionals, millions of students and others who've walked in the door. But I would boil it down uh, in the following way. Number one, uh, when I look at, at you know, Hill's impact within higher education, it does start with serving, supporting, and inspiring Jewish students and uh, our ability uh, to have impacted so many uh, Jewish students over that 100-year period uh, is, is, I think, our, our most notable contribution uh, within higher education and meaningful in that, as you point out, uh, there was a need that was even recognized by other faith groups for creating spaces for Jewish students at that point in a moment where I, it was quite difficult for a lot of Jewish students to feel comfortable, to feel accepted, to feel seen, to be their whole selves in a higher education setting. And so having Hillel as that um, home, as that place where they could be their full selves, Jewishly and beyond, I, that um, that has certainly defined our impact. And just to bring it forward all the way to this year, this year alone, we'll have the privilege to engage more than 150,000 students in Hillel experiences and relationships. So that's how we think about impact in that zone. As you and Debbie were just talking about, though, our impact does go beyond Jewish students. And oh. uh, we certainly have uh, at one level, worked as an institution over the course of the last century to partner uh, between Jewish student communities and other communities on campus. And, uh, you know, I, I hope and, and believe that continues to be a meaningful part of how we drive impact and contribute. But beyond the kind of more formal ways that Hillel partners with other communities, who we serve also extends well beyond Jewish students. It is not atypical to walk into a Shabbat on a Friday night at Hillel and find that 30% of the students there don't come from a Jewish faith background or 
uh, Jewish Connection Point, and that extends on to classes and other programs and leadership development. And we love that. We love being that resource for all students where um, whatever Jewish life can offer at a communal level, again, in terms of wisdom, practice, and relationships, that, you know, that's really an important impact. And then finally, um, we, you know, I, I talk about us now as like a hundred year old startup, right? Because we, and it's very much um, of the higher education space. Higher education, I think it's a bad rap sometimes in terms of um, being its own version of a legacy, you know, uh, set of institutions. But the reality is higher education is where young people congregate and are constantly reinventing. And they're doing that in partnership with um, academics, but very much in partnership with student life professionals. And so Hillel has, you know, been this uh, innovation lab. And so just as an example, I, we spent a lot of uh, time and effort really rethinking what it meant to deliver uh, powerful experiences and shifted a, f a couple decades ago from a, a program-driven model to a relationship-based engagement model. And that not only helped to transform how we do our work at Hillel, but I think our third impact is at our best, we're able to model for other communities and for higher education institutions more broadly, uh, different ways to go about impacting students. I want to- you know, go, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, you go. I want to sort of follow up with that a little bit because I want to ask a little bit more if you can sort of help us understand that turning point, that sort of relationship model. Can you just share a little bit more on that? Because you just mentioned it. I don't want to leave that hanging. Yeah, no, wonderful. And I, I want to make one correction. I think- I refer to engaging 150 students. That's 150,000 students if it didn't come out right the first time. I mean, every individual student is of great meaning for us. And, you know, the aggregate is is 150,000. I'll, I'll pass it to Debbie, you know, who actually has been in the work in terms of that relationship-based engagement model to talk more about what that represents on campus. I mean, I think it's a good moment just to share my own story because that's what mm. um, made me feel connected. Um, I kind of referenced I wasn't so involved um, organizationally, even in college. Initially, my connection to the Hillel at Emory was through staff that took a personal interest in me. How are you doing? What's going on um, in your life? How can we support you? And that led to some you know, involvement, you know, I was very active in my sorority in, it led to involvement in the Jewish Greek Council there at the time. That led to me um, going on a trip to Israel when birthright um, was very early on in its establishment. It didn't lead to me feeling obligated or guilted into showing up to every single Jewish event just because they knew me or were friends. They really, with me, they really cared about me as a person and helped connect me to the right opportunities. And that's really what inspired me to build my career around this. And that's what that means. A program focused model is, we know you, you should come to everything we're doing. Um, we're going to make sure you know about it any way that we can, that technology permits, which of course has varied um, um, over the years. And this relationship model is all about making sure that we really understand who students are and um, are connecting them to the right opportunities, are co-creating new opportunities with them. Um, even as recently as this semester at Arizona State, for example, that means creating a new wellness learning fellowship. Um, like many other Hillel's, we teach a slew of classes every semester that, um, that students can take. And we were just hearing a lot around students caring about wellness, um, wanting to think about how the, that intersects with Jewish ideas and values and their identity. Um, and some students that are the ones who kind of maybe are the ones that their friends come to a lot were saying, I want to take care of my own wellness and I want to uh, do a better job supporting my friends because, you know, I'm the I'm the one people seek out for advice. And so this wellness learning fellowship was co-created with a couple students and our senior Jewish educator, Rabbi Susie Stone. And so from when I was in college and, you know, a little bit before that and to, to today, that's what it means to be focused on um, relationships above programs. And by the way, um, Hillel's across the country, um, across North America and probably across the world are reaching more students now. And so we're actually able to have a broader impact, but I would say also a deeper impact by shifting um, by shifting to this this way of deploying our our efforts. Wow. I I uh, had no idea 
but this all makes sense now. Uh, we have a really strong halal at Michigan State University. And so I now see some of the ways in which that has, has really fostered those connections. Um, Debbie, thank you too for telling us a little bit about your story. Um, you mentioned wellness in particular, and I am really interested in maybe the, the broader perspective. What, what are the experiences of Jewish students on college and university campuses in North America, I think probably is where our audience is mostly, so U.S. and Canada. Yeah, so uh, I mean, like like a lot of other uh, college students today, there there's a lot in common, right? Um, concerns around mental health and wellness are right top of the line. Um, navigating even wherever we, you know, navigating the repercussions of the COVID pandemic um, as it continues is a big one, whether it's um, supporting students who maybe missed a year or two of high school in person, um, and now we're coming to college with a very different identity than um, than what we have seen in the past um, is, is really big. Um, economic concerns, what will the job market look like, and um, things that are dominating the headlines like gun violence and reproductive justice. Um, mm -hmm. Major concerns, I would say, especially, you know, looking at Michigan State, if, if you look at the news around Arizona and guns, there's there's some stuff even, you know, as of this week. And so um, those are things I'd say that are, I'm sure, sound familiar to, to most folks mm -hmm. in our audience. But, I, you know, I didn't I didn't want to leave them out. And of course, um, layer this on top of regular college stressors, relationships, yeah. doing stuff on your own for the first time. Um uh, you know, career, all of these things. And then, so around Jewish identity, I, I'd say there's a couple of things. Um, certainly this is a great place to um, to mention the rise in anti-Semitism that is of concern to us as professionals and to many students. I'd say it's playing out in a lot of different ways. Um, for some students, it's creating, um, it's, it's motivating them to take on new leadership roles and to really advocate for um, support in their Jewish identity. And we're seeing for others, it's really motivating them to hide, um, or at least to hide that piece of their Jewish identity and to not, you know, I would say publicly out themselves as Jewish. And this kind of goes to the second challenge around um, being Jewish today, which is that the multifaceted nature of um, what an, any individual might mean when they say I'm Jewish, um, is complicated and confusing. And so in 2023, that means a lot of different things. It might mean cultural, religious, spiritual, all of those um, and more. And so what college students I'd say are dealing with today is trying to figure out, just like they're trying to express how to define themselves in other ways, how to find the right language to um, an education to back up how they're seeing themselves as Jewish is um, for some students, it's top of mind. And I'd say for those that it's not, that's really Hillel's role is to encourage them to think about that and to, to help them graduate college feeling like they can um, articulate the type of Jewish adult that they're, that they're um, hoping to become or to continue being. But it's, it's really a complex um, thing, what it means to say that you're Jewish. And we see a lot of that. Cody, I'm going to interject because I think actually I want to go to the question that specifically talks about this number seven, because I think we can build upon what Be Debbie just said, um, because I, I think what you noted is so critical that uh, Jewish students are varied in how they relate to Judaism. And I think from a student affairs administrator perspective, you know, how can both we as administrators, as well as our partners in Hillel, better support Jewish students and other minorities on our campuses. Um, and so either Debbie, you want to pick that up first, or Adam, either one of you, I think, um, how can we continue to improve upon recognizing this fact that Jewish students have different ways that they relate? Uh, happy to dive in, but I... <laughs> We didn't cue this to one of you. I know. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, yeah. it's both. Go ahead. Debbie, yeah. go ahead and I'll happily uh, okay. add, to the, add to the comments. Look, like I I mean, there's there's so many ways that um that we work well with administrators and that we aspire to work um even more closely with administrators. And it runs the gamut from things like acknowledging calendar to um participating in educational opportunities to understand the the variety of, of ways that um, students do define themselves as Jewish and to um, 
to open up opportunities to educate paraprofessionals around that too, I think, which are often the front lines. Um, mm -hmm. So residence life, students that are working in residence life, the students that are working in the student unions across the country, um, you know, students that are working in the fitness centers, like do they, are they trained um, on Jewish identity in the same ways that they're trained in other aspects of cultural and religious diversity. I think one really easy thing is knowing that being Jewish is, um, is a religion and um, that's something I think we could all start doing better on. So when someone says they're Jewish, um, it, it's often hearkening back to a connectedness to Jewish peoplehood, to this, mm. the history of this people that has survived and persisted for thousands and thousands of years. We're just coming off of the Jewish holiday of Purim, um, one of the many holidays that celebrates Jewish persistence and survival. And I, that is kind of embedded into our psyche. Um, in, um, in amongst the Jewish people. And I, I think the other thing is that kind of the trauma of being Jewish often is embedded in to people's psyche in different ways. And so um, understanding that, that um, just is not, is not um, more or less than what other minorities experience or need, but should exist alongside what other minorities need um, is something that I think really needs a closer looking at. Yeah, yeah, and I, I would add a couple things uh, because this is so critical in terms of our fulfilling our mission. Uh, you know that we are a resource to um, colleagues and partners across campus in better understanding Jewish students and therefore enabling Jewish students to have the same kind of um, you know, hopefully safe, successful, and thriving student experiences that we want for all students. Um, I think in terms of how we accomplish that. Number one, if you're a student affairs um, or other administration professional, um, leaning into more intentional learning as it relates to the Jewish student population, like hopefully is happening with other student populations, I think that is, is an important step. You can't just assume knowledge based on someone you knew or where you grew up or a show you watched. As, as Debbie said, there is a, just an enormous amount of diversity right now within the Jewish student population and being able to appreciate that, being able to hear what their unique pathways and experiences are, I think is really meaningful. We have a lot of campuses where uh, the Hill has partnered with uh, a, a university administration to create those kinds of learning and listening sessions. And you know that that's simple, but it's so powerful. Uh, additionally, at the Hill International level, we've created something called the Campus Climate Initiative, where uh, we actually take uh, administration partners who generally include uh, student affairs professionals, diversity, equity, and inclusion officers, bias reporting officers, all the way up to presidents and chancellors through uh, you know, an 18-month uh, process where they have the opportunity to do structured learning about the nature of the Jewish student experience, about uh, the contemporary ways in which anti-Semitism shows up, because mm. that also really has shifted and, and morphed um, over recent years compared to uh, the manifestations people were familiar with decades ago. So finding those ways to um, learn, I think, puts uh, everyone on the student affairs and, and administration side in a, in a much stronger position. And at Hillel, we really want to be a great partner in uh, um, in advancing that process, uh, much as, and you know, I want to go to pains to say it, I, you know, we're very much cognizant that there are a lot of communities on campus and the Jewish student community, number one, is just as one community. Number two, Jewish students are not just Jewish students. Almost all Jewish students have multiple identities, right? Sometimes religiously even, but certainly, you know, more than 20% of the students we see at Hillel identify as, uh, as Jews of color. And so, we, we want to make um, opportunities available for learning about the Jewish student experience in parallel with what we know uh, our colleagues on campus need to pursue in relation to all communities. Yeah, I'd say um, disability is another area where mm. there's a significant overlap um, in supporting Jewish students with disabilities. Um, and this, this may veer into kind of what academic services can do to support Jewish students, but something that we see a lot is, um, you know, the Jewish um, high holidays often come towards the beginning of the school year, and we may have students um, with disabilities that are already asking for other types of accommodations at the beginning of the school year, and then on top of that are looking for um, accommodations around 
what would be an excused absence at I would assume of most colleges and universities. And something that I've worked on a lot at Arizona State um, is finding ways to kind of more proactively let students know that that is um, perm that's permitted to um, for them to ask for these accommodations. And I think something student affairs professionals can do as early as in preparation for orientation is um, giving students the tools. And this would go to all, all students that might need some type of accommodation, like giving students the tools that they need to speak up for themselves. You think about, mm -hmm. um, especially first year students coming to college for the first time, um, students might need all types of different um, accommodations. Jewish students need these excused absences often, and it's the beginning of the year. They don't, with the rise in anti-Semitism, we hear some are concerned about even sharing that they're Jewish um, so early on in their year. They don't want to miss class when they're just brand new to school. And um, often administrators will say like, well, of course, that, that that's why these religious exemption policies are in place. Of course, they can have the time and college is an important time for them to learn to advocate for themselves. And, and we totally agree. And that's why Hillel is there. And we still see a lot of students hesitate to advocate for themselves uh, because they're living in 2023 and they're seeing um, violence against Jews and other minorities are, around the country. And they don't, they don't want to inadvertently make themselves a target. And so I think that... Um, the more that universities and colleges can take a step beyond um, having a policy and kind of proactively supporting students and asking for, for what they need act to be successful academically, um, I think the more Jewish students will start to see um, that more proactive embracing versus what often we might see is um, just kind of like a passive uh, inclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, Debbie, this is really like stirring for me, this this conversation on the calendar that you've sort of mentioned twice, you know, er, earlier and then and then very specifically around the Jewish uh, holidays, um, that this becomes a conversation around equity based concerns and 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 DEI. And I'm just wondering, you know, maybe if Adam, maybe we can bring your voice into this, you know, if you can talk about how. Um, and I'm going to use a nomenclature of religious, secular, and spiritual, which is what the CAST standards is using now. Um, but can you talk about how religious, secular, and spiritual identities could be included as a sort of core aspect of campus diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging efforts, and sort of take this even to the next step in this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it starts where you ended, Cody, which is, uh, you know, those religious, spiritual, and secular identities do need to be you know, fully incorporated into DEI frameworks, whether those are educational frameworks, training frameworks, bias reporting frameworks, and response frameworks. Uh, you know, we um, really appreciate that there are so many aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion that, that DEI officers and professionals um, are focused on. And uh, we certainly don't want again, to limit that focus or privilege it in any one direction. Um, at the same time, uh, the students we see, by definition, are uh, viewing their Jewish identity as a core element of um, how they mm -hmm. see themselves and want to be seen in the world. And, um, you know, that in and of itself, to me, would be, you know, we're going to head towards Passover, phrase Dayenu, you know, it would have been enough. It, it would have been enough if students were simply um, looking to make sure that their core identities were seen in the process. But on top of that, we do have so many Jewish students who are feeling, um, you know, affirmatively harassed, marginalized, isolated in different contexts. And, um, you know, that merits uh, hearing that, you know, mm -hmm. Acknowledging it, honoring it, and and addressing those concerns because uh, in environments where uh, Jewish students, or again, it could be students coming from other uh, uh, Muslim students, students coming from other faith backgrounds uh, who are feeling the effects of marginalization or exclusion, uh, when those concerns are put on a different level or not um, seen and acknowledged, it's just so. Uh, hurtful, problematic, painful, or worse uh, in terms of what comes out the other side of it. And again, I'll just point out one particular uh, side effect that we're seeing, which, and Debbie alluded to it, but just data-wise, 
we uh, our uh, team in Ontario just uh, did a pulse survey where uh, more than 50% of the students surveyed said they felt like they needed to hide their Jewish identity mm-hmm. and just out of a sense of um, concern for what the safety or other implications would be if they were fully you know, public about, about that Jewish identity. And so having DEI frameworks that recognize that issue, uh, and, and again, we, not that we have all the solutions, but we really are investing in entire teams to partner with the EI uh, offices to help with the macro data, the macro uh, kind of education on these issues, as well as what constructive policy changes can be. I will, as one particular area of policy, um, or actually I'll, I'll hit two, one is bias reporting. Unfortunately, um, there is sometimes a blockage when it comes to um, Jewish students reporting concerns. I, we hear frequently from those students that um, they're they're basically told, "Not our department. That's no, that's more political, or that's a religious issue that's different than what we address here." So, number one, coming up with a bias reporting framework that is truly inclusive, um, you know, at that level of um, religion and spirituality as well as uh kind of ethnic community uh and then number two what i'll call educational equity it is it seems very impactful right now that so many institutions are um, educating professionals students staff when it comes to um understanding uh discriminatory practice understanding how discrimination actually manifests in higher education um you know that should include uh, in our case, anti-Semitism training. Mm-hmm. So we actually are developing easy ways for DEI professionals to um, incorporate that kind of content, uh, you know, in their education and training activities. You know, Debbie, I want to bring your voice in here because you're living it on the ground. Like we're not saying that Adam's not, but you're living it on the ground here a little bit and uh, and have been doing so. So I'm wondering like, add to this help us yeah. help us understand that sort of that that yeah. that intersection of conversation happening on the ground at ASU. I, I was thinking I, I would be remiss without adding one of my Arizona State um, pieces which is the calendar is near and dear to me because one of the projects I worked on um, mm-hmm. when I was on the committee for campus inclusion here was around the calendar and um, working to we so we already um, our council of religious advisors here reviews the religious calendar annually um, but we were working to add some educational components on our, on this committee to the calendar so that you might click on a particular um, Native American festival or Jewish or Muslim holiday and learn a little bit or click click through to a link through that um, we were also working um, to and and we sit um, on the student services side, um, and so we were we've been looking into how to work with um, provost office around um, this messaging out to faculty, which um, at the largest public university in the country is not a small um, feat, and um, we certainly don't want to be um, unnecessarily calling out professors who, for the most part, are doing a great job supporting students and, and their different needs. And so um, I guess like what I've been thinking about. Um, is both like how to build, how to bridge on the ground to national. Um, and I benefit so much from being part of this national organization, the Hello International. And um, when, and I know student affairs professionals benefit so much being um, part of their national professional associations. And so it would at least me to think like, what can we be doing um, on the national level that will trickle back down? And what um, Hello uh, professionals often share our best practices on working with whether it's admissions or career services or counseling or our local found or, you know university foundations um, for those of us that are public you know what um, I'm curious you know what more the student affairs professional associations could be doing in collaboration with Hillel that would kind of help navigate some of these things um, and then trickle down best, best practices back and so it's certainly like what I'm living on the ground but it's also um, especially for those of us at public, universities, it's it's tough, right? We want to um, honor the way that our institutions were founded um, and the way that they exist in the world. And we have specific 
student needs that we're trying to advocate for. And um, I've really appreciated, you know, at Arizona State, that often means for me learning a lot about other groups that I didn't know as much about and finding ways to support them, which is probably why I've been so intentional about mentioning that at every <laughs> chance I've had, because it's certainly, I'm first and foremost, the director of the Hillel Jewish Student Center. Um, and we, uh, there's so many students that, that need this additional support. And so, you know, I, I'm eager to think about what that looks like through um, some additional national collaborations. Years and years ago, um, Hillel and ACPA were doing some things together. I know Hillel and NASPA also. And so uh, I think that that might be an interesting, you know, next thing, because look on the ground, things are decent here. I'm really grateful for the partnerships that we have at Arizona State. And I know that many of my executive director colleagues would say the same at their respective colleges and universities. And there's more opportunities to continue to, to grow in these partnerships too. Yeah. And if I can add here too, I would want to point out a couple of things more in the positive uh, channel. Number one, as Debbie just said, there's actually tremendous partnership happening right now locally on campuses between Hill professionals and their colleagues and partners uh, across campus. Uh, it really, it's a hallmark of who we are as Hillel. There are, as you guys are probably familiar, several different Jewish related organizations that show up in campus spaces. One of the things we really work um, to focus on as Hillel is being an indispensable partner to the universities where we exist. And so that's you know something that's different actually about the Hillel mindset and also the Hillel approach um, to supporting students. The other thing I wanna celebrate is even Cody relative to the question of how, how can DEI offices and approaches better incorporate you know, religious, spirit, spiritual and secular uh, communities, looking at it from the Jewish community landscape, we're, just next month alone, we're going to have uh, 150 uh, administrative professionals from 40 universities coming together for a discussion about exactly that topic. How can um, you know DEI offices uh, continue to better understand the needs of Jewish students and address their concerns? That's happening, as I said, uh, in North Carolina through our Campus Climate Initiative. And if anyone listening, um, wants to learn more about CCI, the Campus Climate Initiative, you can follow up with me, L-E-H-M-A-N at health.org or Mark Rotenberg, who leads it. Mark is the former general counsel of University of Minnesota and Johns Hopkins University. So we, again, really work to leverage higher education expertise in, in, um, in how we grow in this, this part of the work. That, that is a, a great suggestion. And I think for those who are watching today who are student affairs educators on campuses, um, beyond that, what what other advice would you give to student affairs educators, practitioners to improve their own understanding, right? Like we often do um, encourage folks to, you know, not just ask, you know, people to give, but like what are the ways in which uh, we can do some of that self-work? Um, in understanding and connecting to Jewish students and Hillel on their campuses. Um, Adam, do you wanna continue that thought? Sure, sure, I'll jump in to start, but I would definitely invite uh, Debbie to chime in as well. Uh, I, I think, um, number one, I just circle back to my prior comment, which is the more that in official capacities, you know, student affairs educators uh, and other professionals can convene listening sessions, can, you know, convene ways to hear directly from, you know, a diverse set of Jewish students on, on the campus, you know, that's an awesome opportunity. The, no, the second thing I would say is show up at Hillel. We love uh -huh. to have our partners from campus and, and you don't have to even show up announced always. You can, you know, show up for an event, show up for a program. Um, we learn and grow through having the presence of, you know, uh, campus partners there. Uh, and I do think, you know, for a student affairs educator, it's it's just a great window into not only um, how Jewish students or students who are involved in Jewish life would talk about their experience, but seeing and being a part of that experience, I think, um, is really impactful. And the final, uh, you know, um, suggestion, at least from a Hill point of view, is to, you um, you know, keep an eye out for these growing opportunities to either be a part of the Campus Climate Initiative or attend one of our sessions at NASPA, as uh, Debbie mentioned. Uh, 
you know, we, we've had partnership there and we continue to, um, you know, provide more programming and partnership with um, some of these higher education and student affairs organizations. We just did a, a program in partnership with ACE, um, which was focused uh, on issues of recognizing and addressing campus anti-Semitism. So I think, you know, between talking to students, showing up at a Hill, uh, or showing up at one of these sessions, um, those are great pathways. And, and if people listening have other suggestions for how we can help uh, beyond those channels, we'd love to hear it. So I would say, you know, for the for the student affairs practitioners, um, you know, and student life offices and residence life and career services and some of the, you know, front lines things like look for opportunities for partnership. So often that might just mean taking the meeting when one of us reaches out. Um, we just, those are my favorite meetings. Like, let's just get to know each other so that we can understand how we might partner. Um, and it takes a little bit of time, but it's also a lot more authentic and kind of goes back to our relationship-based approach in general. I often you know, I might have an ask or something if I reach out, but I often am just trying to get to know another colleague on campus and, and make sure I understand how their office functions so that we can seek partnership. So I'd say take the meeting, um, include education in, um, in orientations and RA trainings. Um, I love the idea of coming to Hillel. Um, we all love welcoming um, administrators of all levels at Hillel. And I, I would say if... Um, if something feels hard, like if, if we're trying to find a partnership in it and it feels hard, maybe just being as transparent as possible with your Hillel counterparts about what, what's hard about it. Is it, where are we the first time that we're gonna be doing something like this? Um, is it confusing because are we religious or cultural and it's not clear, but we're both. Um, like what is hard about it? And maybe like invite us into problem solving together. Um, I found that when I've been able to do that, we, again, we learn much more about each other and we can continue to support each other. Um, for us at Arizona State, I mean, one way is um, collaborating on some outreach to high school students, for example. How do we do that? What's hard about that? What's easy about that? Um, and that's that's different for, um, for different campuses, but there's so many ways to partner. Um, I think nothing replaces a listening session, but if it's um, questions about a holiday, you know, the internet could be our friend, right? Make sure that you understand the basics of major Jewish holidays so that um, if you have Jewish students in your um, clubs that you advise or on your floors that you live on, that you um, you might be able to, to share a fact or two or ask students where they're learning, what accounts are they following, what websites are they looking at if they're looking at any, you know, that, those kinds of things really, um, just asking the question is really meaningful. I, I really just appreciate the last few minutes of our conversation because I just sort of want to name something that as a non-Halal professional and also as a non-Jew in this space, I find to be such an important part of this conversation. And that is that the work of supporting religious, secular, and spiritual identities and Jewish identities is everybody's work. And I think that like you've named so many areas of the campus and, you know, we've sort of named the sort of student affairs overreach. And of course, you know, this podcast is called Student Affairs Now, but it's an academic affairs conversation with faculty and administrators on the faculty side as much as it is, is amongst the student affairs professionals. And that's at all aspects from everything, what I say, from admissions to advancement. And so there's always a place to, and I like this listening session idea that if you, if, if you as a practitioner are struggling to be like, this isn't my area of focus. Like religious life is something over here. That's not necessarily as true. And in fact, by actually having those conversations with you all as professionals, I think the folks listening on this podcast and, and, and viewing this today are going to find out real fast just how dynamic and interweaved the work of Jewish life is in every core aspect. So, you know, the last thing I'm thinking here as we sort of wrap up and get, you know, to move toward this is, is, is you all uh, and the work of Halal professionals is so dynamic across those 850 campuses across the world. And we wanna hear you know, any last thoughts that you guys wanna have, but also how to be in connection with all of you. Maybe it's with the two of you, maybe it's just with your Halal professionals. And if you wanna sort of leave those lasting thoughts um, for us um, as we get close to wrapping up. And Adam, if you wanna sort of go first here. Yeah, well, I just want to start with gratitude. It's so appreciative of the conversation. 
And um, Heather and Cody, thank you guys for including us and in, in enabling it. Uh, in terms of, you know, final thought, I just want to leave with a thought of opportunity and optimism. We okay. see in our work, as I said, 150,000 young people that we're able to serve as part of the broader higher uh, education landscape. And um, we all know, and, and anyone working on a higher education knows, there are incredible young people who have the potential to solve problems on campus. And then, you know, there's a notion of Takuna alum repairing the world to actually, mm. you know, vault forward to solve the big problems facing us in the world. And I just want to make sure that anyone listening knows that we're committed to being awesome partners in that process and that. You know, we we start from not again not a privileged set of content or, or wisdom, but a unique set in terms of mm. you know thousands of years of Jewish history, wisdom, community, and practice. And so, um, we're excited to you know promote dialogue across difference and break through polarization. We're excited to take on the challenges of the student experience when it comes to mental health, wellness, wholeness. We're excited to you know, Cody, as you said make sure that, um, you know, the identities that our students care about and want to cultivate are, are seen and recognized as part of all students having their identities understood and recognized. Uh, and we're excited to continue to make higher education, you know, the special place it was for me when I was on campus. And, you know, even as a parent, having seen my daughters just uh, go through their college careers. So looking forward to partnering with, with everyone through the process. I think for me, final thoughts also, I feel really optimistic about the future um, partnerships and the potential for partnerships is uh, one of the things that probably keeps me energized and excited that we, you know, we don't know what's going to come next, but we know that it's good. Um, and so I would invite the same thing, connecting with me on LinkedIn um, or reaching out at um Insta on Instagram at, at ASU Hillel. Um, my personal Instagram is is probably a little boring and less let <laughs> more about um, food and kids. So you know we'll stick to LinkedIn for now. But I um, I just want to say thank you to everyone to you guys for having us. Um, look, I'd say my final thought is that we are um, all in this together. And so um, Heather, when I was listening to your podcast a couple of weeks ago about um, your experiences at Michigan State. I mean, that was what I thought time and time again. Um, Hillel Professional and Student Affairs staff, we're here for the whole student. Whatever they're going through that day is who we see and what we care about. And um, I think that there's much more similarity than there is difference um, across Hello Professionals and Student Affairs together. And I'm just excited for the future about new connections that this podcast might bring, um, opportunities that that are yet to come. Um, and again, just so appreciative for, for this conversation today. So thank you guys. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm thrilled that we're able to amplify this conversation and, and also provide insight and opportunity for folks who haven't yet had an opportunity to connect with Hillel on their campus to do so. Um, we, Cody and I, so grateful for your time today. Uh, and also all of the contribution to the um, conversation on the back end from the folks at Hillel International. I'd be remiss if I didn't shout them out as well. So thank you to everyone. Um, also, huge heartfelt appreciation to the dedicated behind the scenes work of our producer, Nat Ambrosi, makes us look and sound great. Um, and if you're listening today, and perhaps this is the first time you've listened to Student Affairs Now podcast, um, please uh, go to our website. Um, you can also there uh, subscribe to our weekly newsletter and you'll receive an email in your inbox every Wednesday, um, you know, that will just highlight what the new episode of that week is. So you can also check out your archives um, as well. So if you found this conversation helpful, if you can share it on your social media platforms, that would also be amazing. Uh, thanks today, again, to our sponsors. Uh, Simplicity is the global leader in student services technology platforms with state-of-the-art technology that empowers institutions to make data-driven decisions specific to their goals. A true partner to the institution, Simplicity supports all aspects of student life, including but not limited to career services and development, student conduct and well-being, student success and accessibility services, and you can learn more by visiting simplicity.com or connect with them on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. 
And Stylus is proud to be a sponsor for Student Affairs Now podcast. You can browse their Student Affairs diversity and professional development titles at styluspub.com. And you can use promo code SA now for 30% off all of their books plus free shipping. And you can find them on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter at Stylus Pub. Please take a moment to visit the, our website, click on sponsors link to learn more. Again, I'm Heather Shea. Um, thanks again to my co-host, Cody Nielsen, and to all of our listeners and who are watching today. Make it a great week, everyone.